an anchor for Sports Center, the network's signature news and information program, in May of 2016. Friends would tell you that I'm confrontational in one way, and that is when it comes to sports. So I get paid to kind of do the same thing I'd be doing at a bar, which right. is clowning dudes and putting them in their place. Oh, look at that. Some jokes just write themselves. In March of 2021, she moved to the 6 p.m. show with Kevin Nagandi. In addition to her work on SportsCenter, Duncan has been a co-host of the weekly ESPN podcast, First Take, Her Take, with Kimberly A. Martin and Charlie Arnold since June of 2021. And she is among a rotating group of panelists on ESPN's afternoon program, Around the Horn. She has also appeared as a panelist on Highly Questionable. Everybody. Oh, we can do better than that because I have the power to hold this thing up. Hi, everybody. Let's go. You know what's fun about being in TV is these kind of clips that remind you all of the terrible hair choices that you've made throughout the years. So please forgive that. I was like, oh, God, where'd you guys get that picture? It's on me. I'm the one that went out in public that way. We're so happy to have you all here. Officially, welcome to the Black Women in Sports Luncheon, New Orleans Essence Fest edition. Let's go. We have an amazing uh, brunch for you today. We're going to do a few things. Um, I know that this is the third Essence Brunch that we have. We are honoring incredible black women in sports. The first was in LA. We had the second one in Minneapolis. I was so blessed to be a part of that one at the Women's Final Four. And now the culmination, the biggest one yet, the most beautiful one yet, by the way. How incredible does this room look, right? Yes. So today is meant to accomplish a few things, okay? Apart from you getting incredible food, and the mimosa bar, okay, so that. Um, we're here to celebrate, we're here to honor two incredibly deserving luminaries in sports, Swin Cash and Don Staley. But we're also here to discuss, to share experiences. Most importantly, we're here to leave empowered, to impact our communities. We want to come up with tangible measures here today. Like, it's nice to come together. I love seeing all of your beautiful faces. We love a good brunch and we love gorgeous flowers. But if we are not motivated and moved to do something out of this, if we don't come up with real measures to affect our communities, then we have a real missed opportunity. And that's what today is truly about. Caroline Wonga is incredible. And I know that she's the CEO of Essence. And I know that what's most important to her is that we leave here and we touch our respective communities no matter where we came from. And in particular, the community here in New Orleans, one that's so rich in tradition, one that has meant so much to our community, to our culture. She wants to make sure that we are celebrating the women who fill the room. And that's what we're here to do, is take up space and fill the room. And I have to say before I bring her up, has anybody ever had the Caroline Wonga experience before? So then you know what's coming. Stealing from the fact that we're going to have a new edition today, I'm not kidding when I say this. See, I'm already sweating. I have to tell myself every time Caroline walks in a room or jumps on a Zoom with me, literally in my head, cool it now, you got to cool it now, ooh, watch out, you're going to act an ass. And I, I remixed it, but that's what I'm telling myself. I'm like, girl, be cool because she is so incredibly impressive and convicted and engaged. And I'm just so honored to be in her orbit. And all of this is because of her. And so I want to bring her up right now, the CEO of Essence, Caroline Wonga. Let's go. Hey, we New Orleans out. She's the number one stunner. I'm number seven, not number one. I'm just kidding. Um, hi. Hello? Oh, I was just checking. 
Hello. How are you feeling? Yeah? How many of you guys got spent more yes Friday or Saturday or Thursday with us as well? Just raise your hand. Okay, put it down. How many of y'all think this is the best festival we've ever put on? I'll catch the rest of you later. I got some things to share with you. Um, but good morning. Good morning, family. Good morning, friends. Good morning, comrades, as Rich would say. Just good morning. Um, I have the honor of setting up this conversation, um, and it's the easiest part of the job. Because what I get to do is tell the story of a, a mission I've had the privilege to be attached to that started with the vision of the Dennis family to return this precious, precious, this precious, precious artifact that our community calls essence, to return it back to being owned by those it serves. And he's over there, he's gonna be mad that I said it. Rich, go like this so people know who you are. Do this. He didn't do it, but... Um, <laughs> I, you don't think I knew that? That was a verbal clothesline, just to stop you from going. But I, I say that because there is a humility in that Dennis family around the magnitude of this that I have just, I, I'm not going to let them do it. I'm going to tell this story. Because I think it's really important as we think about the change we want to make in the world. And I think that the Dennis family, and my brother Rich in particular, is a perfect model to look at for what it means to truly activate in your personal purpose, invest in us, believe in us, and empower us. Why do I say that? Because one of the things that I have the privilege to do in this job is sit next to a man that truly lives economic inclusion as a human right and wants to make sure that everybody on the darker end of the melanin spectrum, if you're on the lighter end, you too has the opportunity for wealth, has the experience of health, functions with the sternness of stealth. And so my brother, which found out, my brother, I am honored, humbled, grateful, and inspired to have been invited to go on the journey with you. Because without you, and without this journey, I'm having a really hard time thinking about how I would be feeling today if I didn't get to come with you. So thank you. <laughs> this room is filled with people who I could say that to, and because Barclay likes to have agendas and whatnot, I won't get to each of you, but I'll make sure that you all hear your version of that story in my life. I have not gotten to this place on my own, but we're gathered here today, and there's a tie here, right? We're gathered here today to talk about this franchise called Essence Black Women in Sports, and if you know me even a little bit, you know I played three sports, I claimed two. And here's what I mean by that. I started playing volleyball in high school because of my height. I ran track, not as a marathoner, even though I'm Kenyan. My coach was so disappointed, but I was really good at the triple jump. <laughs> I was mom at the triple jump. And then I played basketball. Basketball is the one I don't claim. Why? Don, don't, don't shift. It's, it's going to come to a good end. I was, I, I was, I've been really tall most of my life. I was 5'8 at the age of 11, if you want to know what happened since then. Yeah, and I'm the shortest kid in my family. So I'm this girl walking around high school, all tall and stuff, playing volleyball and track, and the basketball coach is like, what up, though, to my track coach and volleyball coach. So they forced me to play basketball starting in my 11th grade year of high school. And I wasn't good at all. But I was tall and I could rebound. And so I played. Under duress, them girls in the paint almost took out my spleen daily. <laughs> Even though I was in their ear looking like I'm smack it, talking smack, but I'd be like, if you just get off my spleen, you can have the ball. <laughs> I don't even want to be here. Look, three second rule, call it ref, right? Like, I'm like, I don't want to be here. The reason why I tell that part of the story is because 
I ended up playing basketball under duress, but more importantly, because other people saw a potential in me that I didn't see in myself. And Essence Black Women in Sports is a demonstration of people who have, will, or won't, believe in a future that others may not be able to see, Sister Don. I'm sure there's a lot of people that if you would have talked to them up front about what you just achieved, they'd be like, I right, bet, holla, I hope she could do it, but she ain't gonna do it. And everybody in this room has probably had an experience like that. But when we talk about what we're doing with Essence Black Women in Sports, we need to ensure that we are making sure that we are celebrating the sports ecosystem, but not talking about it as a fact that's been at a deficit. What we're saying is that black women have been contributing to the sports ecosystem since the beginning of time. They just haven't been able to be seen. And then the black women, not only are they not able to be seen, nobody even acknowledges they're in the room. So we made a room. We made a room worthy of what our honorees have delivered. And I couldn't be more honored to be in your presence. Because in your presence, for you, for Swin, I get to see what I can be. So there's three things I want to share before we take our seat. Um, and my sister Elle um, and I are enjoying these. And again, we've got a pending album um, that we haven't quite figured out what songs are on it and what our name is. But when it comes, it's going to be huge. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, we don't need a group or a symbol. But I say that because my biggest thing about what Essence Black Women in Sports is, is tied to the mission for Essence that the black woman is the CEO of home culture and community. But what it's actually based in more is a visual for you that I want to share. Bodies of water like oceans, right? Huge oceans are the way that I want you to think about the sports environment. Okay? Then I want you to think about the vessels that are on that water. It could be a sailboat, jet ski, cruise ship, whatever the kind of ships there are, lots of ships. They're the vessels traversing and navigating that water. But none of those vessels are running without somebody in the captain's seat. And the one in the captain's seat are the sisters we're honoring today that have navigated the terrain of the sports industry, shifted through the storms that made you think you were going to drown, excelled when the sun was right and the wind was behind you. For those of us that are in this room that aren't swinnered on, we have an opportunity to not waste this today. If you come here today and you leave and you do absolutely nothing, please depart now. We shouldn't waste our energy on you. We are watching black be under attack. And it is at DEFCON 10. And what that means is that we as a black community can no longer give free passes to those that don't want to fight and are prioritizing self-preservation over our survival. So I need you to sit up right in your seat. For today's conversation is going to be a conversation about how to support what you're already doing, how to get you doing what you need to be doing, or how to help you understand to stop talking about doing something if you ain't. It's that urgent. Call me every name in the book. Just do something about it. We are in a place where those vessels on the water need compasses, need navigators, need everything in the world. And one of us here can play one of those roles. But what's more important is that in the individual challenge that you each have, I want you to think about four aspects of how you can take action. The first of those being me. And me is about what's within your wingspan. It ain't about stuff you don't have. It is about the stuff you do have. What's your job? What's your influence? What's your voice? Who do you know? And how are you making sure that in those settings you are advocating for those? who They don't need your help. They just need people to know what they're doing. How are you going to post on social media about this event? Are you going to say, oh my god, I met Don Staley? If that's what you're going to say, that's fantastic. Thank you. What I'd rather you post is, there's a sister here that all the rest of you sisters looking can be like, too. How do I help you be Don? And you post about the fact that we need to make more Don Staley's. 
You're going to be honored and every one of them will. But I hate that there's so few of you. We might run out of people to honor at Essence Black Women in Sports. I want you to post based on that as the possibility. The second one is about we. We is the person sitting next to you. Right? It's one, it's one more than me. It's the person sitting next to you. And why do I bring that up as a step you need to take? Because we are really good. This is hypothetical. It's not how a girl named Airline feels. There just has to be an alignment in the name. The amount of water cooler talk we do around what we see other people do that we think isn't right, isn't good, isn't respectful, isn't uplifting has to leave the water cooler. And it has to go to the person sitting next to you that looks like you to say, look, you're, you're doing more damage by not doing anything and saying you're doing it versus just don't do it. Because what we don't have is the energy to go into the recess and the hole created by those that fake do it. We got to go over here. Don't dig a deeper hole for us to have to get out of. At least be neutral and stand to the side as the concession stand. That would be helpful. That's the we. Then there's the us. And the us, if we talk about me being you and we being the person next to you, then the us is the collective black community we exist within. And here's the challenge to the us. I'm originally from Kenya, but I've lived in the United States since 1988. Right? What I know that I know that I know that I know is that at the end of the day, the community that I get to engage in that is black no matter what geography I am sitting in consistently, unintentionally gets measured. The health of it gets measured by how the best of us are doing. That's the wrong approach, y'all. We celebrate individuality. But don't say we're okay because Don's fire. Instead of thinking about the health of the us, which I'm referring to as the black community, as being measured by the people we honor in general, think about the health of the black community by the person we help the least within the black community. That's how healthy we are. And that's how healthy you are. I don't care what you accomplish. You're not as healthy as the top. You're as healthy as the most struggling. And until we collectively start to operate from the place of the least of us, we will always miss the mark on getting to optimal health because we started at the wrong place. Your foot is broken and you're over here trying to make sure your face look good. But you can't walk. The last one is world. What does that mean? It means something really simple that is a pet peeve of mine that I'm going to put on the table and then we're going to shut up. All this BS about African versus US black versus Caribbean black versus Canadian black versus Antarctica black, I don't have facts to prove that. <laughs> there, we everywhere. Arctic black. If you allow that narrative to exist within you, you're participating in dismantling who we're supposed to be in this world, y'all. Rich and I are no more, actually no less dedicated to the black community in the U.S. than we are to the black community in Africa and in the Caribbean and in Europe. And the fact that our descent is African and your descent might be different does not mean that we can't represent all and we're not fighting for all. And we keep letting this narrative exist in the fucking, sorry, world. <laughs> I told y'all this is me. If you were calling me, this is how it would come out, y'all. And I'm going to tell you why I'm triggered on that in a second. 
Anybody can believe what they want to believe. What I need the world part of this to do is to proactively dismantle the part of that conversation that is about if you ain't in a black, I certify you don't deserve to help make black better. Because the amount of energy that we spend, and this is honest, y'all, the amount of energy that we spend trying to mitigate around that is taking energy away from what we could be doing. When, when I took this job with Rich, and he knows this, and we were writing the press release, it was literally a conversation about should I put on there that I'm Kenyan or not? Dead ass. You can cut this in the video, Steph. <laughs> then I'll say it again, dead ass. <laughs> Why do I have to sit there and think about if in an interview, on a stage, in a place where I'm talking about this thing that is my job, I gotta be careful about saying if I'm Kenyan because somebody won't think that I can lead them because they're not from Kenya, but they're black like me. That my black can't be their black and their black can't be my black. So when I say world, shut it down. Spend the energy finding what you can do. You don't gotta like me, you don't even think I'm gonna be successful. Just don't dismiss me because I'm Kenyan and I won't dismiss you because you're black. And if you're around people that look like us that are feeding that narrative, tell them they can feel how they want to feel. But please, again, don't touch the silverware if that's how you feel. Because we got to eat. Why am I triggered by that? Because of the last two days and then the next two days. Do you see how beautiful it is for how we gather? Do you see what we've been able to do together unapologetically? Do you understand what this has done to fuel the way that people got to go back and be they black? So what would the world look like? What would it look like? If we did this every day, we wouldn't need white people to save us. We'll take them as allies. We wouldn't need them. And so for those who are coming after us, my ask as we honor our sisters who have done great achievements is to sit ever present in the me, the we, the us, the world that will truly get us to a place where the things that are thrown at us won't stick the same because they're going to our back and not our front because we doing what we supposed to be doing. So today, sisters, I'm so honored to honor you. Audience, I am thankful for the opportunity to engage with you. Rich, I am grateful for the opportunity, but it can all go away if you don't do those four things. And as I introduce my sister Elle and take my seat, you can pretend you're going to the bathroom if that's not what you intend to do. Thank you, and Elle Duncan, ladies and gentlemen. I told y'all. I told you. Caroline, see, she's the reason for the term. Ooh, oh sis. No, ooh, sis is where I was going. By the way, I do want to address the elephant in the room, something that Caroline just said. If there was an Arctic black, it would be me. I know that you looked at me. I know. Um, we want to uh, acknowledge community involvement because Essence, and I know in particular it's so important to Caroline that when Essence comes in every and any community that they're in, that they leave an impact, right? Apart from just the celebration and the ticker tape, they leave a legacy behind. And Caroline, I know that the New Orleans community commitment for you involved, I'm pulling this up on my phone now because I want to get all of this right. 
It's fine. You don't have to. You did everything you needed to. Larry Barabino, who's the president of the New Orleans Rec Department. Where are you, Larry? There he is. Hey. And Roger Mason, who I had the privilege of doing a panel with at this very Black Women in Sports panel in Minneapolis. Hello, he's the CEO of Vaunt. And with their partnership, we have a rendering. Do we have the rendering of the tennis court? That There we go. That will be leaving a long legacy in the community. Incredible, because we're actually going to get into a little bit of this with the panel when we talk about Title IX. That is, of course, what we're commemorating and celebrating, right? Celebrating in some ways, not so much in others. Is the need to get our young black girls involved in more sports and how our young black girls have not benefited from Title IX in the same way that white women have. Because as we all know, to the patriarchy, in many places, diversity is white women. <laughs> Uh, big facts. So we want to thank you so much for your commitment um, and to helping this community and thank you for your partnership with Essence. Before we get to our incredible discussion, it's time to do some celebrating and honor. Can you tell that I used to want to be a singer but realized I was best? <laughs> Isn't it annoying? I know. This is always me though. Caroline's like, I'm going to be me. This is me. That's fair. Yeah, we just have no music, no songs, no shows planned, and no time for rehearsal. Run it! <laughs> Our first honoree is absolutely incredible. She's currently the Vice President of Basketball Operations and Team Development for the Pelicans. Hey! So I could ask her if there's any truth to the rumors that maybe they could be trying to go get Kevin Durant, but I won't. Well, but, but Swin, can you text me? Can you? I'm kidding. But I'm not. If you can give me that exclusive. Okay, oh, it's fine. Her former life, she was a three-time WNBA champ, a four-time WNBA all-star, two gold medals in BD for the United States, one of 11 women to receive an Olympic gold medal, an NCAA championship, a FIBA World Cup, and a WNBA championship. Just so impressive. And if that wasn't enough, she's also a Hall of Famer. And if you don't believe me, just watch. Another one! <laughs> Tenacious, silky smooth, unrelenting. Swin Cash brought all these attributes to the hardwood and much more. A two-time national champion with the Yukon Huskies, Swin has been the poster child for success. After her record-setting college run, Swin took her talents and will to win to the WNBA. Over the span of her 15-year WNBA career, Swin racked in three WNBA titles, four WNBA All-Star appearances, two WNBA All-Star Game MVP trophies, and two Olympic gold medals, earning her a spot on the WNBA's top 20 best and most influential players list. After retiring from the WNBA at the end of the 2016 season, Swin served as Director of Franchise Development with the New York Liberty and went on to cover sports and culture for several different media outlets. Cash currently serves as Vice President of Basketball Operations and Team Development for the New Orleans Pelicans. Off the court, Swin serves as founder of Cash Building Blocks, an urban development company that renovates and offers affordable homes for low-income families. She also founded Cash for Kids, a charity with a strong mission to motivate, educate, and elevate kids through physical fitness, nutrition, education, cultural trips, and sports camps. But Swin's reach doesn't end there. She has also been recognized by the Smithsonian Museum, Heinz History Center with the History Makers Award, and received the March of Dimes New York Sportswoman of the Year and the Freedom Award from the National Civil Rights Museum in 
in Memphis, Tennessee. This year, Cash is a part of the 2022 class of inductees into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. Despite a trove of championship trophies, medals, and esteemed honors to her name, Swin makes it clear her greatest achievement is being a wife to her husband, Steve, and a mother to their sons. Swin Cash is legendary and exudes black girl magic. Ladies and gentlemen, for Swin Cash. I didn't think I would get choked up in here, but uh, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> I will say this, um, I have, uh, there's been, you know, you play for 15 years, uh, you see different videos, tributes and stuff that happen a lot of times, but that by far, probably encompasses like who I truly am. And uh, I'm glad that y'all did it. I'm glad that I'm in a room. I'm glad I'm in the room and could feel the embrace and the love from being just an unapologetic black woman and to be celebrated this way. So I thank you so much um, to Caroline, to Rich, to Essence, um, all of your sponsors who invested and understand that this is important for us. Um, a lot of times people think you win awards and um, these accolades come, but they mean the most and they hit home differently when it's from the people who truly understand the essence of who you are. So thank you so much for having me here today. I couldn't have been here without a better person. Um, Dawn has been a shero. She has uh, been a leader. I won an Olympic medal with her. Uh, I am happy to be here with you today, Dawn, for pave paving the way. Um, not only on the court, but off the court, and from a ph philanthropy standpoint as well, you always um, were the model of what we needed to be. So um, I won't take up a lot of time. I know we're going to come back up here, Elle, but what I do want to say is that I am blessed. I'm honored to be here today. Elle, I can't answer your question, but let's just say we had a great weekend as a Pelicans fan, and I'm looking forward to more to come. <laughs> I forgot to say, L. you didn't see the shirt. Oh, oh we're here for it. Yes, we are here for that. Title IX, baby. Oh, it's coming. Ugh, this one's the best. I'm going to do an addendum, too, based on the video that we just saw that the voiceover lady didn't add. And apparently, Swin Cash does not age. Oh, my God. I'm like, I'm surprised she can come out in the daylight. Are you a vampire? <laughs> wow, Swin. Unreal. <laughs> and we have a baby the same age. Where are the wrinkles? Okay, it's fine. Our next honoree uh, certainly doesn't need an introduction, <laughs> but I'll do it anyway. Because there's a couple of things that are really in particular cool about Dawn Staley. Um, we know that she's a trailblazer the epitome of. She's the first person ever to win both the Naismith as a player and a coach. She was a key member of the dream team that ended up sort of being the genesis, not even sort of, really being the genesis of the WNBA. She is the first black coach, man or women, in any sport to win two national championships. In any Sport. And more importantly, and I'm stealing this from her, because she said this 
There's things, you know how people say things and they stick to your ribs, right? Like you just, you leave there and you keep thinking about it. She said something at the open practice at the national championship. She was talking to the crowd and she called herself a dream merchant. Right. You Like I, I literally said out loud, wow, when she said that, I was never thought of it that way. And I'll let her explain exactly what that means. But a dream merchant, like that's truly, she feels convicted she feels moved, empowered, emboldened to help usher young women and girls into whatever their dream looks like. And that's about so much more than X's and O's or coaching or working on their jump shot with them. She's amazing. And the video will tell you more. A 5'6 sophomore from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, number 24, Dawn Staley. Often referenced as a spark plug, Dawn Staley has ignited the game of basketball on a national and global scale. A phenomenon in her own right, Dawn has breathed new life into NCAA women's basketball as a player and a coach, revolutionized women's professional basketball, and secured world dominance in the pro women's game as a member of the 1996 Olympic gold medal squad. With the collegiate career most could only dream of, of, Dawn wrote her name in the record books as the NCAA's all-time steals leader, garnered National Player of the Year honors twice, reached the NCAA Women's Final Four three consecutive years, and earned the Most Outstanding Player of the Year title in the 1991 NCAA Final Four. And to top things off, she also racked in three Kodak All-American trophies before making her move to the pros. With the passionate and pesky on-court persona, Dawn first took her talents to the ABL, where she made two all-star appearances before transferring transitioning into the WNBA, where she enjoyed six all-star appearances, along with WNBA 10th and 15th anniversary team honors. As coaching continued to call her name, Dawn first took the head coaching job at Temple University, where she led the Owls to several record-breaking seasons, six NCAA tourney appearances, and Coach of the Year honors. She then transitioned into her now collegiate head coaching role at South Carolina University, where she's done much of the same and more. So far, on her record breaking run with the Gamecocks, she's won two national championships, made four Final Four appearances, and earned multiple Coach of the Year honors. She was inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame in 2013. Hall of Famer, NCAA champion, gold medal winner as a player and a coach, black woman, Dawn Staley epitomizes black girl magic and much more. On your feet, Dawn Staley, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Rich and, and Caroline um, for uh, this moment and creating this moment, because a lot of times um, other people have to narrate uh, celebrations and, um, and um, honorings. Um, Swim, congratulations on a lot of fronts. Today, um, Naismith. Um, much deserving and to follow your career I can I, I honestly can can say that I tell our our players that uh, they too um, can be in a position that you're in because you are a, a trailblazer um, in a space in which did not have a whole lot of women so thank you thank you um I mean uh, L told us it was going to be an experience in in here in Caroline and it was an incredible experience. I think sometimes in your life, um, you you work so hard and you don't really see that you're, made, you're you're penetrating, and then you have a moment in your life where it just energizes you. And and Caroline, that's what you did. Um, I was uh, holding on to every word that you said, and will continue to challenge myself to uplift young people in, in our community because it's, it's necessary. And I'll, and I'll end with this. Um, I had a friend in college who was a Q-dog, a Q-dog. And um, one of their sayings is, friendship is essential to the soul. And I'm gonna switch it up. Black people 
are essential to the soul. Thank you. have Swin come back up. And I'll say it um, because Don won't say it. We mentioned a couple of times, two-time national champion coach. Um, would have been a third if not for the pandemic, but that's fine. It's fine. It, I'm serious. If they hadn't canceled that season, we all know where the Gamecocks were headed. Just getting the mic situations situated. Shout out to DJ Aisha Irene too, you guys. Yeah, make some noise for her, fantastic. Okay. I love it here. So I mentioned that uh, this is the 50th year anniversary of Title IX, um, which of course was 37 words that for the very first time had legislation surrounding discrimination against women. And while we know that sports is not mentioned in Title IX, sports has probably benefited the most from that legislation, uh, which protects right uh, women who are looking to, at any financial establishment, uh, protects the rights of women from sexual harassment, sexual violence, and equality. But I wanna ask you two ladies, as women, and because while Title IX came around in the 70s, you were really sort of that first generation of women that you could say, quote unquote, benefited from it or were able to use it. So when you look back, Dawn, on your career, how does Title IX inform what you were able to do throughout your career to land you here today? I don't think her mic's on. Yeah. I'll say this, I, I, Title IX was very beneficial to my career, so much so that I didn't really think about Title IX. Mm. I, I just played. I was just able to play um, wherever, in school, in college. Um, and then you grow in the game and you become a coach and you, 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 you're, you're actually on the 50th anniversary. There's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of people that just want to get a quote mm -hmm. on it. And... Obviously, they, they come to me because I'm a, I'm a black coach, and they probably think it benefited me a whole lot, so I have a whole lot to say about it. Um, and I do, but probably not what most people think. Um, Title IX, to me, um, is a great thing, don't get me wrong, but there's also a dynamic to it that is unforgotten or not as uh, addressed and that is our black community, our, our black bodies are, are not given the, the opportunities on a whole lot of levels. And one is, is college coaching. Black coaches don't get the opportunity to coach as, as, as much as our, our, our white counterparts, whether it's male or female. Um, we, we, we go in droves. Like it's, it's probably a little bit more popular now to hire a black coach versus when it was maybe five years ago. I know there was an influx of black coaches maybe 15 years ago, 10 years ago when it was popular. Um, I, I think, I mean, the majority of uh, our sport is made up of black young women. And I do think that black young women should be coached by black coaches, not a hundred percent, but certainly at a, at a high percentage so they can see themselves um, in their roles. There's, no, there's nobody that can help a black young woman navigate through this world than another black woman. I mean, seriously, I mean, it's not to say that there aren't other good coaches out there because they, they are good coaches out there, but I'm, I'm talking about outside of the outside of the four years that you're at an institution, 
you're going to have to navigate in this world that don't see you as equal, aren't going to pay you as equal. They're going to pay you 64 cents on the dollar. So you're going to need somebody to help explain why that is. I think I would echo what, what Dawn said in regards to just the ability to get a scholarship. Um, I think in my mind from Title IX, I look at where you know, University of Connecticut was in 1998, you know, if Title IX wasn't in place, like how many black young girls would have an opportunity because there's scholarships that you have to have on the women's basketball team? So for me, that was probably my first introduction. Um, over the years to, to what Dawn said and her point, um, it's almost somewhat a little bit become commercialized. And when I talk to young girls about it, I ask them to go even deeper, thinking about Title IX and, and how it protects certain women. I mean, women on college campuses. And uh, it just goes a lot further. We talk about the 37 words. I think the other part of it, too, is I'll take it to professional level, um, being brought up in the era of having the privilege of Title IX and being there 50 years when I got here to New Orleans and as we looked at like our coaching staff and what it needed to look like, Dawn made the point about young black women being coached by black females. You also got to think about the percentages of NBA young black males and they talk about needing black men, but they also needed black women. So when I came here, one of the first things for me was I had access in a room to try to say, okay, we need to have diversity. What does that look like? Having those conversations. So Teresa Weatherspoon, we need to go get you because I know you can connect as a black woman with these young black men and how they hear you, how you coach them is going to be important. So I think being brought up in Title IX, understanding the equity, diversity, all those different things that should play a part in it, you take that not just from the collegiate level, but you also have to keep applying it as you go into the professional ranks as well. Yes. Um, I, I find both of what you do very interesting. There was an article, I don't know, Dawn's very busy, I'm sure she doesn't see random articles from the Charlotte Observer. <laughs> but there was an article that was floated a couple of weeks ago about how the Hornets should be hiring Don Staley as their next head coach. And, you know, he had a compelling argument about how successful she is and da 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 da, da. And I suppose it pissed me off because it feels like for so many people, the idea of a woman building something from the ground up like you did at South Carolina, making a legacy that impacts and helps women, it seems like for some people that's a stepping stone to working with men. And I was mad because I said, she is a Hall of Fame coach that has built a program from the ground up, a dynasty, and yet you think she's just sitting around waiting for can I say it? One of the least important franchises in the NBA right now. I'm sorry. She just won a national championship. And yet we think, well, clearly she's itching to go work for Michael Jordan. Why? Why? And I wonder, I suppose my question here is, how do we, as women, continue to make an impact within our own gender and sex without needing to feel validated by getting to a level where we get to work with men? Well, well I, I think people generally think that the NBA is the pinnacle. Sure. Right? Um, I, I, for one, I don't. Um, nor, nor do I think the WNBA is the pinnacle. I've never, I've never wanted to coach in either league. Um, and probably some of my coaches who coached me the WNBA thought otherwise, <laughs> but I didn't. I, I think my my I mean, being a dream merchant is really what's you know what what's in my DNA. It's like to help young people once they get to that to that you know when they when they journey to getting to the WNBA or getting that job that they've wanted all their lives and, and equipping them with the, with the tools to help them be successful for an infinity, that's what I get the most joy out of. You know, if, a, if an NBA team wants me as their coach, 
um, it, it's probably not on a on a basketball level. So if they want to come at me that way, it's more of a, a a challenge. You know, that's what basketball has done for me time and time again. Is it's challenged me. Do I think I can be successful in any arena? Uh, when it comes to basketball, absolutely, because it's, it's basketball. And it's working. It's, it's about working with people. It's about having a relationship with someone and, and, and getting the best out of them so they can perform at the highest level. That's the key to any, any success as a CEO, as a leader, as, a, you know, as an employer, is getting the best out of the people that you work with and, and helping them grow. So, I, I mean, not... I, I, I read the article. I did read the article. Um, the article. I mean, those when those articles come out, it 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 actually helps me solidify my thinking and knowing that I've made the right career choice over the years, and that is to, you know, that is is women's basketball. It's college women's basketball to help, you know, fulfill my my debt to basketball. As a trailblazer, Swin, on the men's side, someone who is creating spaces that we've never seen before, right? Is it unfair? That, do you feel burdened with a responsibility that if you don't get it right, then there will be no black women behind you? Because I do feel like as a trailblazer, there is burdens put on you, right? It's like you have to be the prototype. And there's a lot that you're shouldering there. How do you reconcile continuing to break the glass ceiling whilst knowing that you're going to be judged and, and everyone behind you will be judged based on what you've done? Yeah, that's a great question. And absolutely, but I want the smoke. So for me, it's like, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> if you're going to peg me and say you're going to be the highest ranking black woman in the NBA basketball operations, what you going to do with it? I want that shot every time. It's like us playing playing basketball. The game's on the line. You want the shot or you want to make the play, right? So that's how I kind of approached it with that mentality is that there are going to be these ups and downs. There are going to be things that challenge me, that challenge me in that room. Uh, there's going to be things that challenge me about my job. People are going to watch me, whether I'm at Combine, what she have on, what sneakers. Oh, she's carrying a big bag. Other women don't carry a big bag. Oh, she's doing this. All those little petty things that I could get in the weeds about, I just try to pay, don't pay it a, a lot of attention um, because I know that God's positioned me for a reason. Mm -hmm. So that's what I get up to, get up every morning. I get up every morning and I say, you know what? I have a solid foundation. Um, I know, you know, who I, whose I am. And I know I walk in that every day. And I know other young women are looking at me. And they're more important to me than the people that are trying to either get me out of that position or not see me succeed. And I just wanted to make one other point to the NBA versus WNBA. People think that I just ran to the NBA. Now, yes, it paid more money. Sure. But I actually wasn't offered an opportunity to be a GM or to be a president after spending a couple of years in the WNBA. Wow. And the feedback that I got was, oh, you needed more time, or maybe you can go on the business side and then transition back to basketball. And to Dawn's point, we know the game. So if you're not going to give a former player access right away to be able to get there, but you can go hire a lawyer because he can do some contracts, See, that's the problem. When I got hired, hired here in New Orleans, it wasn't, oh, you spent 10 years in the NBA, you've earned your keep. It's, you're a Swiss Army knife. I know you'll figure, out, figure it out and get it done, so I'm going to put you in the room and see what happens. That's the kind of access that we need, and that's how I got to the NBA instead of the WNBA, because I wasn't seeking either of them. You were happy being a fantastic broadcaster. <laughs> I was in broadcasting yeah. with my family. Yes. I was working with the Liberty and when they got sold, it's like, all right, WNBA, what are you going to do? Nothing. Hey, I'm still good in broadcasting, yeah. but I saw the hires that were made. And if you go back a couple years, you'll see the hires that were made and it wasn't black women. So we go, we go where we, the opportunity lies and you go and get in that space, not because you become a figurehead and, oh, we hired a black woman. Are you going to let me come in and do my job? Are you right. going to let me come in and grow? Those are the questions past just to hire. 100%. So. And I'm also a firm believer that, like, we don't have to apologize. I know. I know that I got my job initially at SportsCenter because they needed black SportsCenter anchors that were women. And that's okay. But I got that second and that third contract because I earned that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. 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 Like, 
if you just give us an opportunity and let us show you what we can do. Let us show you our value. As we wrap this up, I just want to very quickly ask you this, because this is a room filled with, I believe, allies, right? Um, taste makers, people with very important jobs. Hey, John Mount um, from Coke. As we reflect on the last 50 years of Title IX, what can we, you're doing everything you can from your positions, using your status, your cachet, your clout. What can we do here to help support the next 50 years of Title IX for the girls out there still to come? Um, it, it's all about opportunity. You know, Twin had never been in that position before. Look at her. Yeah. Look at her. She's never, you, know, you, you don't. You don't always have to have the education to back up. If you've been in the trenches, that's experience. So you have to give people opportunity. I, I do think you need to treat um, women's sports as a sport. As a sport. Okay, not a sister to anything. We, we are a sport. And if you allow us um, this space to make money and not keep us you know, down here, we, the money's green up there as well. Like, and I, specifically women's basketball, women's mm -hmm. college basketball, because, you know, there, there has been, um, there has been decision makers that have decided that, you know, women's basketball is not a, this is what they told us, it's not a money-making sport. But they've never tried to give us an opportunity to make money because March Madness has always been men's basketball and they make billions and billions of dollars. And I, for the life of me, I can't understand why what you want to capitalize on the women if you pour into it like you poured into to men's college basketball. And it's coming. It's coming, but it's going to probably take as many years as it took to get us to this place and to get us out of where we were. I also want to give a shout out to, to Angel McCartry, another Olympian yes. in the building. Oh, Angel's coming. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I guess my call to action, um, not a challenge, just a call to action, is that we have to take up space wherever we are. Um, social media, uh, at your job, at the recreation center, at the little league with your kids. Like right now, I feel like I don't have a daughter. I am a woman, but I'm fighting like hell for the rights of women, for the rights of our game, for opportunities for our game. Not because I not because I'm a mom of a girl. It's because I don't want my two sons growing up in a goddamn world that they think that they are higher than or better than. Yep. And so you can't sit there and say, oh, because I have boys and, it, you know, you can figure out a way all the time to say it's not my problem. It's all of our problem. Mm -hmm. And we have to, like Dawn said, are you buying tickets to college basketball games? Are you supporting the WNBA? Are you supporting even women at your job? Like this is important. And our, our next action steps is we have to take that approach. And if you take that approach together, I'm telling you, I know Golden State had it and they talked about it, and I shouldn't be saying it's New Orleans, but the strength in numbers, yeah. that is a real thing. But not just the strength in number of women, strength in numbers of black women. Yep. That is where we have to be and that's where we have to live and grow. And our allies, I love you, I support you to my husband. He was supporting and doing stuff for WNBA players, not on the strength because he had to. It's because he loved me enough and saw the value in all my other teammates. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of allyship we need. That's the kind of sponsorship dollars we need. We don't need sponsors saying, I'm going to give the NBA X amount because I value you here. And then the WNBA, ah, we're going to give you this much. Like, we have to start having an action plan for all of us together. And that's what I hope we can do moving forward, though. Thank you. I, it, it, it's, women's sports is not a niche sport. It's not pickleball. If you build it, they will come. It's like, it, uh, I mean, I, I work in sports. I'll see people be like, did you see the numbers for the women's game the other day? I'm like, yeah, you put it on ABC. <gasps> Imagine people watched it. Like, it's not... <laughs> 
Well, they just act like it's like, I can't figure out how we, you know, they do the chicken before the egg. Like, how do we grow the game? Well, you come up with compelling storylines and it really sells itself. Um, so thank you so much, ladies, for that, for your advocacy, for everything that you do. And again, that is a call to action for our allies out there. Black women did not create this disease and we should not be tasked with curing it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Swin Cash and Don Staley. All right, how we feeling? Everybody good? Everybody want to reflect really quick at their table about, I, I, I asked that because we do have a panel coming up and I know it's hard to sit and listen for a long time. So if you want to get out, key key with your table, that's fine. Because I really want, um, we have an amazing panel and I really want to make sure we've got everybody's full attention and everybody's feeling energized. So we good? Where's my girl DJ Irene? Is she is is uh is Isha Irene here? No? Okay. All right. I was gonna say, put on like some music and let's get that energy back high. No? Do, 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 do. No? Okay, all right. We'll just move right along then. Okay. See, I'm letting y'all talk. I'm letting you get it out because then I want everybody's full attention. So we have an amazing panel that we're gonna bring up. Should I just bring them all up and we can introduce? Okay, great. So if you're on the panel, you know who you are. Come on up and I'll individually introduce each of you. Also, I'm a big believer that with like these kinds of discussions, again, um, this is not the aquarium. You don't just like have to sit and stare. If you have questions or you want to engage in the conversation, these women are amazing and have a lot to say, um, then please like raise your hand. I'll call on you. The room's not that big. You could stand up and ask a question uh, because this is what we're here to do, right? Is is collaborate. This is a collaborative panel, if you will. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panel. I'll start right here with my girl, Angel McCautry. I've known Angel, hey, I've known Angel for, God, how many years now? It's been a while. Our Atlanta yeah. dream days, let me tell you, in Atlanta, cutting it up. We were good. We never did anything bad. Oh, my God. <laughs> She's a two-time gold medalist, a five-time WNBA All-Star, two-time NBA scoring champ, six-time All-WNBA team, and the first woman at the University of Louisville to have her jersey retired. Make some noise for Angel McCautry. Thank you. <laughs> I am going to ask for the people that are back there. I know you can hear me. If you're at the bar, I totally feel you. Bring me one back. Also, um, if you could just, we can hear you. So if you could just keep it like a little bit quiet so we can respect our guests. Thank you so much. The walls are thin. Uh, okay. Next to Angel. <laughs> okay, so if you stroll down her um, Instagram, You'll definitely not go for the shrimp and grits. She's known as the queen of abs on social media because of her workouts and fitness regimen. Santia Deck is the first woman to sign multi-million dollar contract to play professional football. She's the first female athlete to own her own shoe company, which I believe you can get right now at Champs. Let's go. And she attended Texas A&M in track and field. Hey, how you doing? And lastly, I actually told Michelle this. I was lucky enough to be on a panel uh, with Michelle Roberts. I was not on a panel. I'm lying. Look at me. Revision is history. I watched her on a panel years ago at the ESPN Women's Summit, and she just said so many things that stuck to my ribs. I mentioned Dawn saying she's a dream merchant. 
Michelle Roberts was the former executive director of the NBPA, which of course is the Players Association for the NBA, the first woman to hold that position. She was the first woman to head a major professional sports union, that being that. Former attorney, undergrad from Westland, and a law degree from University of California, and now she's using her powers for even more good in this world. Michelle Roberts, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So I'm going to start sort of in the same place that I started with Don and Swin, which is that when you think of Title IX, as we reflect on these last 50 years, how do you reconcile how Title IX has affected you, its impact, and where we still need to go with this type of legislation? Well, we know we still have a long way to go, but it, it's, it's really about planting those seeds. People like Don and Swin who have really been impacted by the Title IX uh, and the one thing about the law with Title IX was that it was kind of about, you know, sex discrimination, and they didn't put sports involved with Title IX. So now that sports is being more involved, we want to plant those seeds and let people know the women are here. They can do what the men can do. You know, they, these girls work so hard, and they have stories to be told. And I think that's the main thing is to, to tell the story. A lot of people don't know what these women go through, you know, how they got to where they are, how they became champions, injuries, being moms, you know, having husbands. It's, it's not easy, but I think all that ties into Title IX and let's keep planning the season, speaking up about it. Check, check, check. Okay, um, no, so I totally agree with what she just said. Um, you know, I think there's progression being made, but there's still such a long, 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 long road that we have to travel. And to me, it's just all about continuing to protect us. And I feel like as female athletes, you know, unfortunately, you know, we're often looked at as almost like the underdogs when it comes to, you know, our male counterparts and we have to struggle to get things that they have or we just don't get it at all. You know, in women's football, it's extremely hard to get paid. Um, it's still a lot of people that don't even know women play football. You know, flag football is finally taking off, but there's so many women out here that are dreaming to be these professional athletes, take care of their families, don't have to go through these different struggles of, you know, uh, being treated differently, um, being looked at in a different type of way because of, you know, you're walking into a, a male-dominated space. So for me, it's just about continuing the protection and continuing to elevate us in whatever sport it may be. So I don't have any talent, athletic talent, never did. Ne I never did. Real, real fast, when, when I was, uh, went to high school, I ended up going to a predominantly white high school, and I was really tall at that time for my age, and the gym teacher started salivating. And I said, nah, you, you got the wrong Negro. I, I, I don't have any ability to bounce a ball. So when I, Title IX didn't do a thing for me because I had no skills, and I would not have gotten, and I did not get an athletic scholarship. But, but the, the, the thing I'd underscore is that Title IX, while thank God there is some impact that it has for women in sports and at, women athletes, Title IX talks about the absence of sexual or gender discrimination at, at any university that's receiving federal money. So I'm not just talking about how you treat your athletes. I want to know why there aren't women who are athletic directors, who are coaches, who are university presidents, right? And so the, for the next phase, for the next 50 years, and hopefully it won't take another 50 years, we need to both continue to impress upon these universities that they have to treat the male and female athletes the same. But let's make sure that we get more people, more decision makers in sports administration that are women. And of course, since we're here, we're talking about black women. We, it's interesting, I did a panel, you know, a lot of these panels are happening surrounding Title IX where everyone wants to just pat themselves on the back about it, but we did talk about allyship and what that looks like. And it also involves when you take your boys to the college or universities for their visits, asking about Title IX compliance, asking about how many black women are feeling, having an interest in something that does not necessarily affect you personally. We also in this discussion, and I thought it was interesting because at the time, I was talking to these young girls, and they were from Grant High School in Portland, and they were undergoing, their high school was undergoing a $150 million renovation. And so they were promised a new softball field, um, along with the new baseball field that was going to be built. 
And for the first time in the school's history, they were not going to have to play at a public park where they were picking up dog poo before their games or where people would play a game of Frisbee during their game because there were no fences and it was a public park. And then, of course, as we all know, through time, those plans got weaker and weaker until the plans were eventually pulled. And it took, they were 16 and 17 years old, it took their coach in her 40s who understood Title IX going to them and saying, we can school the school system based under Title IX and make this happen. And I was shocked at how they never heard of Title IX. Like they were completely unaware of this legislation or the fact that they had protections. And I wanna, I'm not trying to call anybody out, but I wanna know, and, and just by a show of hands, how much you understood of Title IX and the protections and rights that you had under it when you were 16 and 17 years old? Show of hands. Roland, of course Roland Martin did. There's like three hands in here. Me either. We have a whole Women's History Month, and I certainly didn't learn about it in school. And that became a larger conversation on how much we want to influence our young girls by teaching them about Title IX, and does it do psychological damage that at a very young age, we are already telling girls they see you as so much weaker and less than boys that they had to put legislation in 50 years ago. And, and should we be teaching them that right away or should we let them build the confidence and, and, and feel as though they are empowered and equal? And are we doing more damage by sort of setting them up to expect that they'll need to use this protection in the future? You, what do you think? You have to, it should be taught in school at a young age for, for men and women. You guys saw uh, in 2019 the NCAA men's locker uh, uh, weight room and the women's weight room. This is 2019. Are you kidding me? What was it like? Two little, yes. you know, it was and, like shake weights. <laughs> yeah, it was like it's like stuff like that. It's like wh where do we even get the mindset to even do that? And here's a little example. I was eight years old playing basketball, what I love to do, and I beat a little boy in basketball. His response to me was, "Girls are not supposed to be basketball anyway." So, so what makes a little boy say that to a young woman that just wants to play sports like him? It's obviously something that had been taught, because where would he get that from? So I think it definitely needs to be something that's implanted in schools um, to, to let them know what it is, the history behind it, how we can grow, how little boys should think toward little girls, how they should be treated as equal if they want to play sports. Come on, come play with us. You know, that, that's just how I feel about it. So unfortunately, I, I feel like it's something that we have to do. They have to know about it. Uh, me being, having a twin brother, um, and I was a, a super tomboy growing up, you know, I actually had a mom who made sure that I didn't feel that discrimination. So if my brother went to football camps or speed and agility camps, she would say, well, she wants to do it, so she wants to come and try as well. And even though their faces would be like, why? Like, why? Why are you trying to push this? My mom would be like, because I don't want her to feel like she's less than her brother. So for me, I grew up with that mindset that I don't see that division. And if I do, I'm going to still walk in that room and I'm going to let you know why I'm here. So I feel like they need to know that it exists, but we also need to let them know that, OK, even though this might still be a thing right now, you are still able to overcome this. You're still able to elevate from this. You're still able to walk in this room and prove that you, that you deserve to be here. And we're honestly going to always be in a position until there is change where we have to somewhat prove ourselves. You know, me playing women's football, <laughs> the things that I've heard that why are you not in the kitchen cooking? Why don't you want children? Don't you want this? And I'm like, yes, I do, but I can, ha I can have this. I can dominate this room, and I can go out there and be a good mother and wife as well. So I'm going to teach my daughters to do the same thing, but awareness is important. We have to know what's going on to know how to navigate through it and how to overcome it. I believe in breaking through glass ceilings, so I have to know that the ceiling's there in order to break through it. So that's how I feel. And, and real quick, can we get rid of the name Tomboy? What is that? Women play sports. It's, that's it. Yep. True. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> We could only all wish to throw like a girl. Michelle, I'm interested, I'm, I'm, I'm interested though, because right now what we are seeing is yes, an assault on women in this country in general, but we're also seeing Title IX being now weaponized, Michelle, to discriminate against transgender kids. We are now seeing people, bad faith characters, take that legislation and say, ah, oh, see, this is supposed to be about, you know, women who were born, naturally born women, and I, I'm, I'm wondering when we look at the next 50 years of Title IX, hopefully sooner than that, 
how much onus and responsibility falls on us in this room as well to make sure that we are looking out for the protections of the LGBTQI plus community? It, it, it cracks me up on some levels that people are, are surprised that the LGBT community has to deal with this. Like we're free, right? <laughs> it's not as if that they fix all the problems that relate to African Americans or black people and, and Hispanic people, and so now they found someone new. I mean, it's, 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 it's not surprising at all that they, anybody that's, that's different is in trouble in this country. And it's gotten worse and worse. We all know this in the last, last five or ten years. So, I mean, our allyship is, I encourage because, frankly, we're all in this together. I mean, if we think that it's okay to, uh, I'm, I'm, as long as black people are all right, then I'm good. Come on, now. That's not, that's not, that's not going to work. I mean, I, 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 I don't know that things are necessarily going to get any better um, with Title IX, given the current composition of the Supreme Court. Um, but I do say that the, to the extent there's an, an expansion of hostility towards people that are different is a, is a problem that all of us have to be mindful of. We don't simply say, well, that's, that's the LBGTQ community's problem. It's all of us that are different that have to be and feel challenged by this assault on yet another minority group. Um, Title IX is but one, one weapon, um, and to the extent we can, we can identify and, and utilize others, we have to. But I, I can't help but be depressed about the, 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 the role of hatred in our community, the growing role of hatred in our community. And I don't, I don't find myself looking down on LGBTQ people because, well, my issue's already been fixed because it hasn't. Hey, take, yeah, take my hand, come on, let's, let's join, join this army is the way I sort of view it. I want to, so when I mentioned before that Michelle, and I, I want to get the whole panel on this, said something that stuck to my ribs y years ago. She was just talking about um, how she got to the role of, of being a trailblazing, you know, executive for the NBPA. And that it was not you, Michelle, right? I don't want to tell your story, but that it was not you that ever really saw yourself in that position, similarly to what we heard Swin say, right? Um, and I'm interested in, and I would love for you to share when we talk about empowerment, and I think this is more than just sports, but when we talk about black women stepping into their power and, and, and wanting to take on more roles and bigger roles and, and more substantive roles, you said something that stuck with me about men being irrationally confident and not feeling like they need to meet any qualification in order to go for a job. With women, meanwhile, feeling like they need to hit every single mark and then some before they will even consider applying. And I just would love for you to share your experience for the women out there that feel like and know that there is more waiting for them, um, but the, op the, the opportunity is there, but they're just not seizing it. They don't feel like they can. I mean, I think, and I can't, can't recall who mentioned it, there's something empowering about seeing someone that looks like you doing something that you want to do. Right? I mean, I, at an early age, knew I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, but the truth is, I didn't even see a black woman lawyer until my second year in law school. Um, the good news is that a black woman, I called her mommy, is the reason I believed I could be one. But there was something about seeing that woman, and, and as it turns out, I, I, she wasn't even very good, but she you know, didn't, <laughs> didn't, didn't much matter. That gave me incredible confidence that I was, that I was gonna get my law degree and be a successful lawyer. I did not ever intend to work in sports, because again, I, I, I viewed stupidly, like many of us, viewed sports as you can only be in sports if you're an athlete. The ecosystem surrounding sports is incredible. It is a billion dollar industry, and you don't have to have an ability to bounce a ball to make money in it, all right? So I, but I hadn't thought about sports. When I saw the position, um, I'm not gonna lie, it didn't even occur to me for a while after I decided I went, wanted to apply, it didn't occur to me for a while that there had not been a, been a woman or a black woman that had ever had that position. It finally did, because we don't have the luxury of being that oblivious to the world. Um, but it occurred to me, by then I'm an, I was an older woman. If I was still in my 20s or 30s, I probably would have been intimidated. But at that point, I said to myself, 
I don't think I know anyone who can do this job better than me. Now, yes. they can hire somebody else. And when I saw the other candidates, I was even more confident. <laughs> I said, there is no one that can do this job better than me. But, but, but I'll say this. We don't do that enough. Many people, and I was heartbroken to discover that there was only one other woman who was white that applied for the position. Now, when I got to sports, I met a lot of, lot of women. I don't know enough, but so we have to stop telling ourselves, well, there's never been one, and there probably never will, so I'm not even going to try? What? And now I'm retired, and you know who, who took that position? Another black woman. Yes. yes. You talked about the ecosystem in sports, and Angel, when we talk about the WNBA, when you talk about really any professional athlete, right, in general, um, there is a limited window of when you are going to have your playing career and when you have to move beyond that and look for your future. For the WNBA, as someone who plays, how can we as women, allies in this room, how can the WNBA, how can any women's sports make sure that their women are primed for the next step and phase of their lives in the same way that they do for the men on the NBA side? I always tell the, the young kids to ask questions. Half of the kids, they're being coached like people like Don, and they don't even know the history that she has or, you know, Swin. I tell them, ask the questions of who's around you. These people have been there. They've done that. They have the experience. Know who is teaching you. They're legends. So, and I tell them, it's all about, you know, creating that community, networking. That's what I wish I would have done when I was younger. I'm learning that as I've gotten older. But those things carry weight when you, when you are transition. Because now, people I've known... Uh, from the game, I can call and say, hey, I want to try out commentating. And then I got my gig in NBA TV. You know, so I think it's those things of asking questions, knowing who's around you, networking, not being afraid. Like she said, it's that confidence. You know, when you walk into the room, they've given jobs to people off confidence and not knowing the skill, then people who know the skill are, are not as confident. So that plays a big role. And women, when a man says no, it means no. When a woman says no, it means negotiation. You know what I'm saying? So th that's the difference in who we need to start being. You know, a whole word. <laughs> Santia, for you, like being at, we you're you're essentially and you mentioned this trying to legitimize an entire sport. Right. Like Angel doesn't have to do that. Swin doesn't have to do that. Dawn doesn't have to do that. We're certainly fighting for more everything, more money, more TV, more of attention and platforms. But you're actually part of something trying to create that. What is the most challenging part with trying to get people to open their mind to something that A, they don't even know exists, or B, have preconceived notions about? I would definitely say the most difficult, I would say, thing for, for women in football is actually being seen as a legitimate sport. People, and definitely tackle, so I play flag and I play tackle as well. So. <laughs> Flag, I think, is a little bit easier for people to digest, you know, no offense to men, but especially men, um, because it's like, okay, I don't have to, you know, try to, I guess, imagine these women uh, hitting each other the same way that men do or, um, you know, just having the same type of injuries and things like that. So I don't think it's like a big issue, but when it comes to tackle and then we're fully in gear and we're out there doing the same exact thing, we, we're out there being Barry Sanders and Odell Beckhams and things like that, I think it's just like that's hard for them to accept. You know, so for me, it's just about, you know, opening up their mind and saying, hey, we're more than just, you know, how we look. You know, I, I don't know if people have heard of LFL football. That's the lingerie football. You know, if anybody plays, no offense. But that's <laughs> the main tackle football that most people know. Um, but they're known because of how they're dressed. They're dressed in lingerie. And also because you have to look a certain way to even be, be in this league. You know, I literally didn't know what I was getting myself to, self into when I first got into that league. I didn't even know we were going to be in lingerie. But I had questioned the owner. I said, why? do we have to wear pretty much bathing suits? And his response was, this is my league. If you don't like it, you can get out. And I'm just like, well, I'm just trying to understand because how is this moving us forward? This is sexualizing us. This is where we only have old, older men in there that bring their sons to experience this, I guess, experience. So it's like, I remember being on the sideline 
and there's people literally saying, hey, can you show us your, your, your boobs? And I'm like, is this what women's football is, everybody? So for me, it's like there's so many talented women that play this sport. There's so many women. But we don't even get the chance to have the exposure, to get the support, because we're so overlooked. So for me, I'm trying to show people that we can do everything that these men can do. I also want to teach women, period, not just women football players, but utilizing our platforms while you're still an athlete. And even when you're done, it's still so much room for us, especially on social media. So it's like we have to support each other, first of all. So come to the games, come to the football games, come to the soccer games, the tennis games. But also make sure that you're utilizing your plan B because eventually your plan B is going to be your plan A. So when you're done and it's said and done, you want to make sure that you have something that you can fall back on, you can be proud of, as well as your sports career. So for me, it's not just about what are we doing on the football field? How are we getting more money so that we can actually have a plane ticket instead of having to drive to games? It's about, okay, after this is said and done, what can I do to impact this sport overall? So when these little girls come up, they are now being paid and not being say, saying, hey, thank you for your service for, for playing, you know, return your gear, and that's, that's all you get. You get a little trophy, but we, I have injuries. I have ACL injury right now. And guess what? I have to pay for my own, my own hospital bill. That's, that's how it is. So it's, it's, it's just like, it's so much I can say. I don't want to keep talking, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, you said so much. I think that you, you hit on something too, Michelle that I find, as I've gotten older, have found myself having to recondition myself. I think we've been conditioned as women so often to say things like, I'm trying to show them I can do the same things that a man can, or we're almost held to like a man standard. Like, can you do this like a man? And I just wonder, Michelle, when we'll get to a point where we can embrace all of the uniqueness of being a woman and what that means and brings to the boardroom. What's wrong with owning and sitting in our femininity and saying, because I'm a woman, I'm uniquely, you know, um, uh, I'm uniquely ready to do this job, as opposed to saying, let me prove to you I can do it just like a man can. You know, I, I, it took, and I'm not going to lie, it took me a minute before I began to have some confidence in my ability to be the best in the room. It took me a while. I mean, I, I remember... You know, those occasions when I ran into the ladies' room and I was crying because some mean male judge, you know, yelled at me. And, 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 and I, just, I, it, I stopped when it occurred to me, because I was a criminal defense attorney, you don't have time to be crying in the ladies' room. That brother is going to jail if you can't do your job. And I, I, stop, I just stopped. And so what I wanted to be, and what I continue to want to be, well, now I'm retired, I don't want to do anything, but, <laughs> but what I've always wanted to do was be the best person, the, the most talented person in the room, right? I, I, there was no one I wanted until I became a, a, a manager, then I wanted a lot of smart people in the room with me. But I, my goal was always to be the best. And that would include being the best if, the, if my opponent was a woman. So I, mean, so, so I, I, I think we need to, I, what worked for me at least, was to stop do, doing two things. One, Pretending I was going to go to sleep and wake up a white man, right? That was not going to happen. And so if that wasn't going to happen, then I needed to agree that despite the fact that I was not going to wake up as a white man, I could still be the best in the room. Um, and then to the extent that, that I needed to answer the question, can you do it as well as a man, um, I, I reminded myself that the smartest person that I've ever met in my life was a black woman. Um, I, again, I call her mommy, but the, the, the notion that, that I should be either, either ashamed of being a woman or ashamed of being black or both, you've got to just get that out of your DNA. Um, I don't apologize to anybody for being a black woman. And I, I, I've stopped, it's, it took a minute, but I stopped thinking I had to make you get it as opposed to continuing to remind myself that you got this, right? Yeah. I actually, oh, I got a funny story about that. Yeah. So I'm in a restaurant, and this guy's like, oh, you play basketball. And I'm like, yeah. I was like, you know what? You should come to a game. If you want some tickets, I'll give you some tickets. He's like, well, he's like, do you jump as high as LeBron? I said, no. He's like, do you run as fast as LeBron? I said, no. Why should I come to a game? I said, well, sir, I run faster and I jump higher than you. <laughs> <laughs> and that, there you go. <laughs> Um, I love it. Uh, isn't it the best? Whenever like these dudes on Twitter, the thumb thugs, that's what I call them, thumb thugs, and they're just like, oh, 
they, you know, it, they, it's too fundamental. They just do layups. I'm like, okay, well, they would beat your ass at the Y. Um, in, in Adidas slides, by the way. Part of, I think part of two, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to call myself out here. Part of one of my challenges is that I lean a lot of times on diplomacy. I am a rule follower. I kind of always have been. Like, if you tell me, um, you know, that, that, that this is going to be the best thing, sometimes I don't question it, and I sort of fall in line. And I'm going to call myself out here, and uh, Caroline uh, brought this up. Caroline Wonga brought this up on our, our prep call earlier as well. At our last Essence Brunch, we were specifically asked not, because it was streaming, not to mention Brittany Griner on the stream, that we were going to shut down the camera and we were going to talk about her because it was the elephant in the room. You can't talk about anything right now without acknowledging that she is not here where she should be, right? But that was because at the time, we were told diplomatically it would be better if we didn't create any waves, like let the government handle it. It could create a worse situation for her. And sort of unquestioningly, we just like did it. And it was like, well, it, it, and I wonder, have we failed her by waiting, by letting them tell us, don't, we got this. They don't got this. She's been gone for a hundred and what, Don, 36 days. And I wonder what we could have done and how we learn from that situation and stop just accepting what we've been told and stand up for our sisters. I don't know if that's a question more than it is just a statement and I apologize to her family because I should be doing more. I should be on sports and her saying it. And I, I just assumed I was doing what I was supposed to be doing and now it's been over three and a half months. And um, I just, I wonder, as we are finding our voice, for the women out there that feel like they have things that they want to say, please don't. Yeah, Come please. Up. And Swen too, if you. If you. I, I, I just want to say this, Elle, um, about Brittany. And we've been um, just, you know, on the grounds trying to do what we can to keep raising awareness and prioritizing it for us because we know her, we love her, we know her heart, uh, we know her wife, we know her family. And I would say this, Elle, when, when they tell you this, like, tell me if you think ESPN would want the first interview when Britney comes home. Would they want that? Well, well, that's the kind of energy we need to bring her home. And if we keep that in mind, if... If the ESPNs, the ABCs, and the CNNs, and the MSNBCs, if they would do something every single day, make this a story every single day, like they're going to get the first interview when she walks away from that Russian prison, if that kind of energy is going on right now, she would be home by now. And I just want, I just want to say to you, L. You are not the only one. And my heart's breaking because I see you and a lot of people had to go through the same thing. And whatever it takes right now, we can't look back at what happened in the past and when people say don't talk, do talk now, and you just don't. I know my dad served 30 years Marine Corps and I know what he told me. And that is that every single day people have to be talking about it. If you know somebody that's in the news, you know somebody that can write about it, they need to be talking about it. Because every single thing my dad told me was going to happen months ago has happened. So it is no longer in the past. Do not feel bad. Whatever Dawn just said, we got to do whatever it takes to get Brittany home. Right. So right. use your platforms, everybody, to send Yes. Here. Amen. Thank you. I, I think it's time because when it first happened, uh, we were taught to keep quiet. We don't want to spark anything over there. Mind you, I played in Russia for three, four years. We've been in, in and out those borders tons of times. They know who we are. They know we're basketball players. It ain't nothing new with us going over there. I do think that she was targeted a little bit with, the, with what's going on. I do believe that. Uh, I do think it's time for us to start some good trouble, you know, and st really start speaking out. Like Don said, we got to 
It's time. It's time. Let's get her back over. I don't think we have anything to lose at this point. We're really, really just put it out, support her foundation, like just do whatever you can. Um, look on the Dubbin Bay websites. Um, just please, because we just need to get her back. I don't, you know, and, and knowing Brittany, her personality, she's such a, I know she's 6'9", but she's a big teddy bear. You guys know her. She will, if she was here right now, she would have you guys laughing the whole time. That's her. So just her mental state. Keep her in prayer, y'all. You know, please. We heard Caroline say it earlier. If you take nothing else away from this, please don't just tweet like how gorgeous it is in here because it is like if it's just about Britney today, if that's all you post about, then that's that's OK. That's enough. Um, it's hard to not make those parallels, though, ladies, why she even had to be in Russia. LeBron James does not have to go play in Russia. So how do we in this room, Michelle, I'll start with you as someone who was in those meetings with your former position. How do we use our clout and cachet to ensure that our women have all the opportunity that they need here so they don't have to seek opportunity in Russia? You know, the, the collective bargaining agreement that was in existence for the women players um, when I started was, I, I thought, weak. But, but I also thought, and, and, and the reason I love Swin so much, Swin was on the executive committee of the Women's uh, National Basketball Players Association and got rid of the executive director at, of that organization because she was weak and brought on someone who was strong. And the CBA that was negotiated, this most recent one, the, the emphasis was on you're going to grow this sport. You're not going to say, well, you don't make enough money. Well, yeah, it, took, it took the NBA 75 years to get to where it is right now. So you got to, you know, don't say no one's watching it. Who made the point? When they put the games on ABC, they, the numbers were, whoa, people are watching it. Market. That's what you did with the NBA. Market the women. And so, you know, I, I, the, the, the woman that's running the, the WNBPA right now, the, the union, is a sister. The commissioner is a white woman, but the, the, the union is a sister. Um, and, I, and again, my, my successor is also a black woman who is very engaged in the WNBPA. So as long as we're in the room, and when I was in the room, I wasn't representing the WNBPA, but when I was in the room, I would always ask, well, what are we doing for the W? My players, I call them my players, my former player, my, my, the people I worked for <laughs> were also very supportive of the women. I mean, you know, you've seen the male players wearing the Brittany, Brittany Griner shirts. So those of us who look like us have got to be of the view that even though I'm a man and I'm making LeBron James money, uh, these women need to get more money too. And so the, the game, I think, is, has grown because COVID sort of gave us a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a wrinkle. But it has grown, and I think it has every potential to grow as long as the NBA it has their feet kept to the fire. Um, it, it's basketball. If you love basketball, how can you not love watching women's basketball? It's basketball. So it, it, it'll happen. Um, but it'll only happen if those of us who are in the rooms keep talking about it and keeping the conversation going. Angel, that doesn't have to be rhetorical. You're an actual WNBA player. Uh, what do you need to feel supported? What do you need to make sure that there are enough opportunity in this country for our WNBA players that they don't have to seek opportunity elsewhere? Yeah, uh, I did 10 years, uh, well, actually 12, 12 years overseas, and it was a long grind. I would play in the WNBA. I would go play overseas. You talk about being tired. That's why these knees now got a lot of miles on them. <laughs> but I would just say, um, like she said, market, because people want to watch who they know. I'm sure, how many of you guys met LeBron James in person? Okay, one, one person, right? Two people. But uh, the rest of you feel like you know him, so you'll come to watch. So if they don't know who they're coming to watch, when I meet people, and I'm like, come. They say, oh, yeah, we'll come now, because they know who they're coming to watch. So if you market us, our stories, who we are, where we're from, you know, like, when I, when I, people always say they only know Don Staley and, like, Lisa Leslie, well, everywhere I go. It's 144 girls in the WBA right now, plus you got all these legends like Swin Cash. They need to know them in their stories, you know? 
I think that's the main thing. Market us. Because how, how do they know the NBA players? They're out there. They market them. The brands push them. I said to myself, I said, I'm going to start asking the brands I work with for things. And if I get a no, I just, I just get the no. So I went to Adidas, and I said, you know what? I said, I want to do a basketball court. I want to have my own basketball court. And I said, I want my image as a black woman on the court in Louisville, where I went to school. I want to get that done. They came back two days later and said, you know what? We're going to do this. We need, you know, we, we, sometimes you, as women, we just got to go, go push ourselves, yes. you know? You just said a whole word, Angel. Sometimes we, it's like, it's almost like fear of retribution or fear of yes. no that prevents us, we're our biggest deterrent, prevents us from asking. All they can do is say no, but you never know until you go and ask for the money. Absolutely. Um, we had this brunch I mentioned in Minneapolis at the Final Four where the South Carolina Gamecocks would go on to win. I'm sorry. <laughs> And, um, and we were honoring at that time Cheryl Swoops, a uh, legend, as we all know. And she had this moment of vulnerability that really touched. Was anybody in that room that touched us all like so deeply? We were all in tears, um, which is great when you wear fake eyelashes, <laughs> as you're probably seeing now. If it's crooked, just tell me, okay, sis? But she was talking about how you know, she was reconciling this idea that she was being honored by Essence and that she was essentially the face of the WNBA and like women's basketball at the time. And that she found herself all these years later at times, not right now, but at times after her career, struggling to put food on her table. That, that she felt she had been used up and then put to pasture and not taken care of. And I wonder, as someone like you who's young, Santia, and I, I want all of you guys to jump in here, but how do we make sure that we are protecting the women who blaze those trails before us? How do we make sure that short of giving them plaques, that we are making sure that they have a road to financial stability and literacy once their careers are over and the leagues are done getting what they want from them? So one thing I learned um, when I was playing football, uh, this is probably about four years ago, something my coach said to me that really, really stuck with me, and, and it does to this day. He said, don't ever let this sport use you, use the sport. And so when I, I interpreted that as, yes, I'm going to get out here and I'm going to give you my blood, sweat, and tears, but I'm also going to make sure I gain something back, whether, and that's, whether that's financial, opportunities, um, being able to inspire and motivate the next generation, and what I decided to do and what I, what I encourage everybody to do, I already said it, make sure that you have that plan B because we all know that we have very, very limited time as athletes. We also know as women, we don't have the best financial situations most of the time. So what you have to do is make sure that you're still creating that revenue for yourself, you're creating those platforms for you so that when you step off the court, the track, the whatever, whatever sports you may play, you're going into an even better situation. And something that I, I made sure that I did was I had the opportunity to be sponsored by bigger brands, like the Nikes, like the Adidas, but I said, I already know what this is going to be. A, it's going to be a product deal. I'm going to get unlimited Nike shirts and clothes and shoes, or I'm going to get pennies compared to the, Lebr the LeBrons, the, OD the Obel uh, Odell Beckhams and things like that. So when I had the opportunity to create my own shoe, I said, I'm going to take that route. And of course, people said, that's not even possible. How are, how are you going to create a shoe? How are you going to create a shoe company at that? And no woman has ever done that. And I said, okay, so why not me? Why do I have to sit here and be fearful of what could be or what might be. And when I decided to create Tronos, which is my shoe company, and I have to tell people, this is not a signature shoe. Nobody gave me an opportunity. Nobody said, um, hey, can you sponsor this shoe? This is my company. Like there's a Nike, there's an Adidas, there's Tronos. So I made sure that when I got to this place, I can give these women what they deserve. So I can sponsor them. I can give them $100,000 deals, not just say, hey, wear my shoe but go out, you know, get, go out there and sweat for me too, for free. So I'll make sure that I'm able to create opportunities for other athletes to have money, to have those sponsorships, and they can have their own shoe line if they want to. So I can give them a Michael Jordan deal. But if I would have said, you know what, I'm afraid, oh, you know, I'm a woman, and nobody's ever done this, let me just, you know, let me just come over here in the corner and just say I, it's not possible. But I say, you know what, 
I'm going to take that leap. And if I fail, I fail. But if I don't, oh, my God, these little girls, these little girls, like I'm trying to tell you. So it's, it's, a, it's, not, it's not being afraid. Like, don't be afraid to take that leap. Don't be afraid because when I tell you, the world is going to tell you every single day what you cannot do and what you cannot be. So it is your duty. It is your duty on this earth to prove them wrong and to go inside of you. And I don't know if everybody's in here believing God, but I do. I'm a, I'm a child of God. I ain't afraid to say it. But it's my job to utilize every single talent, every single gift. And this is my, this is my like, you know, gift to the world. Because I know that there's other little girls that have came out and said, oh, I didn't even know I could even do this. I didn't even know this was possible. So I want to show them that it's possible. Amazing. You, instead of begging for a seat at the table, you just created your own ecosystem. I love it. How do the people in this room, Michelle, use their visibility? Because these two have the, the you know, uniqueness of being the actual athlete themselves. Not that they're not CEO and businesswomen as well, but you're in those boardrooms. You have been in those boardrooms. You're the ones dealing with commissioners. Dealing. So for the people that sit in these boardrooms that are here, how do they use their power, their influence, to, for the betterment, not only of the girls behind us, but for the ones that are moving on after this, to make sure that they are set up financially to move on to the next phase of their life. You know, Carolyn made the point. If, you, if you're in that room and you're just content being in the room, get out of the room. You're not doing me any favors, right? And I'm, when I'm in those rooms, what I want to do is shame, the, the, <laughs> to, to the extent I can, the people by saying, damn, y'all don't know any other sisters? The first meeting I had with Adam, I said, oh, no women, huh? No black people. Oh, that's just one black guy. It was Mark. Um, and the next meeting I had, th th there, were, there were black people. So, you know, you, you, we, you, can't, you can't say, you know, I made it and that's the end of it. Every single one of us that has some power in this industry needs to make sure that we exercise that power for the next person that's going to come along and to bring someone else in the room, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is, with sports, and I keep saying this not only because I wasn't an athlete, but it's just true. Sports is more than the, uh, being an athlete. The, 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 there's so much damn money that's being made in, in sports. And most of that money is not being made by athletes. And it's because we're not, and, 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 and that means that it's not being made by people that look like us, because we're not, uh, 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 we don't understand that there are agents that are making millions of dollars off of athletes. There are lawyers that are making millions of dollars. Media, millions of dollars. Finance, marketing, it's a huge ecosystem. So the one thing I would always do, and I heard someone say this earlier, is tell, tell current athletes, you know you're not playing this game forever. Use the connections that you can make while you're playing and think about what else you can do outside of playing the game that you can do once you have to retire. And then finally, this is what I tell young girls when I talk to them. Don't think that, that, that sports is male-dominated by accident. If, if, you, if you want to be in sports, then go and be in sports. If you don't think you're going to be able to get in there, good Lord. See, that's the Lord confirming oh, all this ominous, stuff. right? <laughs> That was the Lord testifying, Michelle. The Lord confirming all this. Amen. It was like, say it louder for the people in the back. <laughs> but the bottom line is, we, is, is won't we, he do it? <laughs> that's the truth. We, we just, we just, we can't be content with our own success. I and mean, that's 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 what I would say to everybody in this room. Don't be content with your own success. We have, we we were here for a reason, and that is to to grow our community. Well, in the panel uh, with this, I'm going to go down the line here and ask each of you this, because we've certainly, I think, done a lot of talking about and dissecting sort of our experiences and the challenges that come with that, and that's why we were here. But I'd love to end on the thing that I, I've tried to say this, you know, to to my bosses at times as well. Um, I think we all got called. We were all phone a black friend after George Floyd, right? I was definitely phone a black friend. They were coming, right? Did anybody else get the text from their white friends that were like, I'm embarrassed to be white. I was like, don't make it about you again. Uh, <laughs> but um, but um, the thing I kept trying to tell my boss is, it's like you guys like sign up for like, like, like porn tragedy. Like I, I, like to be a black woman, to be black people, we are such a joyous people. We have 
There is so much beauty and joy in us and what we bring and what we do. And so I would love for you to just end this panel telling me just the best thing about being a black woman in sports, Angel McCautry. <laughs> um, best thing about being a black woman in sports. I, I would just say being a part of the growth. Being a part of the growth event, watching it grow. Um, I, do, I do believe that women will finally get their first million dollar contract. And people like Swin and Dawn have paved the way for that because now, you know, in, in my generation, we get more, you know, and I think the next generation, they'll sign the first million. So to watch the growth and be a part of it, it's a beautiful thing. Special. Santia? And so much I can say. I think, I just think that we are superheroes. I feel like, you know, when we are, honestly, we are the best at what we do. We are the trendsetters. We are what people, you know, the younger generation aspire to be. Um, and we are just, we're always, always, always defining the odds. So I feel like we're trailblazers, tra I can't even talk y'all, trailblazers <laughs> and glass ceiling breakers. And um, I mean, what else, what else is there? I was waiting we for, for the thunder. <laughs> no, okay, okay. <laughs> And lastly, you, Michelle, what is like, with your experience and, and everything that you've done in your life, what to you is, is, gives you the most joy of being a black woman in sports? For, for, me, for, for me, it was watching, and again, this is this individual to me, um, seeing these, first of all, these black men who hired me believed I could do it. I mean, I, I was proud of that because it, it occurred to me that their mamas had already told, told them that a black woman can do anything, right? And a lot of them had black mamas who saved their lives. And so the, the confidence they had in me. But what I really enjoyed, and I still enjoy it, is when I see, and I'm talking about the black men, because I, you know, our, our men need to get it too. When they see us doing things that they typically see a white man do and do it better, I, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it empowers our entire community. I've had more black men say to me, I'm glad that you got that job because I have a daughter that I want to be, have believe that can happen. And Swin, you, you, you could not have said it more beautifully. If you've got black sons, you want them to see black women that they're worthy of, of calling their wives, right? So it, it's, it's, I, I, we don't, we can't, we're, it's true, we are magic, and to the extent we're in any industry, but certainly in sports, and we kick ass, we, 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 we change, we can change lives, not only lives of people that look like us, but from people who are potential allies, so that's why we need to have more of us in there. I'll say as we wrap that, personally, my joy in being a black woman in sports, and just a black woman in general, is getting to see greatness like Dawn and Swin and these people here and knowing as a black woman myself they had to move heaven and hell to get there and the idea that we are watching women in real time fight everything fight culture fight the patriarchy patriarchy fight systemic racism fight foundational inherent discrimination and still become the best of the best is just inspiring in a way that I will never be able to convey and is one of the greatest honors of my life, is just to witness greatness. And so thank you all so much for your time. Please thank this incredible panel for their words. And shout out to Black Girl Magic Wine in the building, right there in the back. And I also want to give a big shout out. I mentioned John Mount. I want to give a big shout out to Coca-Cola because their investment is real in this community, in our people. They are on a mission to make sure that there are more of these events. And I want to thank you so much for your partnership, John, with Essence. We really appreciate the impact that you've made. It certainly had an impact on us. Here's the beauty. The music came back up. Let's go. Hey, we got drinks. We got food. It's time to mingle. We can take pictures. Thank you to Don Stanley and Swin Cash. You guys have a great afternoon. Yeah.